This lecture is titled The Creative State of Mind and we are going to try and find a blend of experience and knowledge in ways that the creativity of each one of you is spurred in the right direction. Now this is really not a very simple matter although it is also a joyous matter. Uh, so a blend between simplicity and complexity I suppose that we will have to handle. The reason there is complexity I think is uh, quite clearly uh, linked to the socialization process and also the academic context. We will not talk about the socialization process very much but we certainly need to talk about the academic context. Earlier in this module I had pointed out that this course takes into account your academic context and the manner in which it has shaped you. I think you are at a point of transition therefore for you to actually try and see how the disciplinary boundaries within which your consciousness and your knowledge has been shaped whether you can now take a plunge into it interdisciplinary directions. The term interdisciplinary is very loose and much will depend on what kind of institutional background you have, whether there are number of different disciplines uh, that are polarized and yet taught to you or whether you really have not been exposed to what can be considered as sort of a different kind of discipline. We will identify these disciplinary boundaries in a minute or two but certainly once again I would like to point out to you that interdisciplinarity involves a new way of defining issues, experiences, problems and also solving them. It, it does not, uh, we do not want to stop with mere definitions, we want to move on with creation whichever direction that creation takes us to. So in that sense once again I would like to prepare you for certain amount of complexity and at the same time retain your own sense of self that is the kind of blend we are looking for. My dilemma is linked to the fact that as educationists we contribute to you know system of over specializations. The point is uh, without really radically rehauling the system because at this point in time when we are talking to each other it is really not possible for you and me to radically rehaul the system right from primary school or school levels to higher education. Therefore it is within the existing system that we have to pitch our argument. And so what one is really concerned about when one talks about over specialization or the disciplinary boundaries is not really linked to the significance of that kind of knowledge but it is really the kind of rigidity that sets in. So that instead of even asking new questions within one's own field one keeps repeating the solutions that have op already been offered or sometimes make a rehash of the earlier solutions. So it is the kind of rigidity that one really is trying to fight against. Therefore the issue is you know, how do you man maintain your firm feet in a discipline for which you have been trained and then at the same time move to other disciplines or other areas of knowledge or other ways of gaining knowledge and at the same time consolidate your position because I really would not like you to feel disoriented or I do not really believe that at this point it is right to talk about rehauling your own sensibility or your own training methodology. So whatever you have learned if you begin to critique it I think certain amount of openness is possible but that will not happen automatically. So are there ways that we can develop for this to happen? This is what my concern is and therefore uh, I am actually trying to explore 
some kind of common ground that we can share across the board. So, whether you are a student of science and technology or you are a student of uh, the fine arts or liberal arts, whether we can across the board move away from already given ways of gaining knowledge within the field, within the protocols of that field so to say and at the same time you know gain new perceptions, new ways of moving in fresh directions as I said without losing your feet in your discipline. The other dilemma while talking about these issues and processes and possibilities is related to the fact that creativity itself has a paradoxical nature. Therefore, many people, many, many people, many educationists, many thinkers and many creative practitioners have asked this question many times if creativity can be taught at all. There seems to be certain amount of skepticism that institutionalization curbs creativity and I do not think we can take that criticism lightly because the kind of delicate balance that needs to be maintained as I said between experience and knowledge between your discipline and new disciplines that is something that does not necessarily guarantee a creative result because one has to have a certain kind of striving for this new thing to happen and therefore you know without the kind of guarantee that everyone wants the kind of certainty that everyone wants from institutionalizations then the question is does it merit this kind of institutionalization a course that is taught or courses that are taught regarding this whole you know elusive process of creativity. My take on this is that uh, increasingly young people would feel the need for creativity discourses without a sense that they know the direction or without a sense that they really want a very clear cut answer that is my hunch because I think increasingly when we are saddled with different kinds of issues and problems and uh, no scientific technological solution has solved all of our problems no social paradigm has worked completely uh, cultural issues also keep emerging. So, in that kind of chaos and uh, uh, confusion which I have already located in this whole notion of globalization and the subaltern you know that kind of the range of issues that these two extreme situations throw up I think increasingly young people would feel the need to relocate their own sense of self in paradigms of creativity. Therefore, I am actually very, very optimistic although I do not really want to be very naive about the problem areas that such an activity would generate. So, then although I am aware of these limitations, these difficulties and I know many of these questions may loom large in the minds of those who institutionalize educational activities, I, I have a feeling young people may not really be uh, daunted by a new way of doing things. Perhaps they will give it an opportunity that it deserves. I have adopted a generative approach and again the approach is based on the belief that the young are ready for independent thought and they can actually find and discover new directions. I have a few ideas that I have listed here again. So, you can go over these ideas in terms of what this open ended exploration is all about, but I have already talked about it. So, I will not read each of these points here. The most uh, important take or the most um, important entry point in this course is related to the notion of play. So, when we talk about creativity, although though we have talked about creativity in historical terms. We have talked about the changing notion of the term creativity. We have also talked about the fact that 
in the Indian context, we may have different kinds of words and uh, we may have different kinds of connotations and expectations and desires. But at the same time, I would keep the term play at the center of our entry into the discourse of creativity. And the reason I want to do that is related to the fact that the term play it sort of evokes a sense of freedom, a sense of joy or roughly you can describe it as a looseness of being. And I feel that some of the exercises that we attempted earlier with you, exercises related to childhood experience and the undifferentiated play that you generally see in children in different conditions, you know, d you know, whether it is a happy condition or a difficult condition. When you think of children of different classes, different backgrounds, one thing that universally stands out is the propensity of every child to, in, you know, play with whatever is available in, in, in the environment. They play roles, they play with objects, they play with ideas, they play with the language. And in that sense, it is undifferentiated play. Now, this notion of play again is based on intuitive understanding and that is really not all that intuitive if uh, I really begin to examine my own sense or notion of play because it is based on one's own experience but also the experience of raising children and watching number of children in the process of play and therefore on the one hand it seems intuitive but it is also highly influenced by the writings of number of writers who have evoked their childhood experiences while talking about their adu adult contributions. I do not remember each of these quotations right now but immediately Jean-Paul Sartre's words comes to my mind, immediately Marquis and his Paris Review interview in which he had some vivid descriptions of how ideas from his childhood, images from his childhood, metaphors from his childhood loom large in his consciousness and they sort of grew into his novelistic endeavors. Uh, I can think of Munji Premchand's writing from that perspective, I can think of Rabindranath Tagore's writing from that perspective. I can think of Einstein and his comments on his you know observation of the world as a child. As I said I do not remember the exact words, I also remember Rishti and Rishti's comment about how he wanted to recreate the vivid memories of his childhood in Bombay, Mumbai now. So in that sense I suppose I am you can say romanticizing childhood. It is possible to look at it this way. This, I became aware of this quite sharply when uh, during the discussion of this exercise, one of the students had really severe difficulties with this idea. Uh, he felt that the term play itself is not accessible to him. He felt that he associated a sense of trivialization with play. Now this of course surprised me but I also do recognize that each term that we use and especially a term like play and especially when you talk about it very enthusiastically almost as a utopian kind of uh, experience that it is quite possible for you know people or young uh, students or young learners to really react sharply to this because they may not really conform to that experience. They may not have recollections that are so very positive or so very joyous or so very vivid also. Now I do not want to go into any analysis of why that could happen but I certainly was made aware of how there are different kinds of sensibilities amongst the students and there are also different experiences 
and therefore in undertaking this activity I am not undermining those experiences because I, we know very well that the discussion of any kind of experience finally gets contextualized. You know how, what are the conditions in which you have lived, what are the conditions, what are the emotions that have been encouraged and what are the uh, emotions that have been repressed. In fact, if I may, I will just quickly read the, an excerpt from this write up from the student who found it difficult to relate to this line of thinking and uh, this is what he has to say. He says that more often than not, I have seen that this condition feeling or idea gets internalized by most children early in their lives. He was talking about a sort of approved ways in which you are supposed to feel and think. Now that is his take, I mean I really do not agree with this, but the take was that you know when he thinks about playfulness, he feels intimidated by the idea and when he started writing about it, instead the memory of the death of his grandmother loom large and in fact this memory made him realize that he was expected all the time to function within a certain pattern of socialization process approved emotions and therefore this particular statement is made in the context of this other tragic memory that intruded but without a sense of the tragic so to say. So this is what he has to say. More often than not, I have seen that this conditioned feeling or idea gets internalized by most children early in their lives so as to become almost natural. For me, the chasm between an externally foisted feeling regimen and the relatively more organically bred internal one was quite wide even then. It brought with it a great sense of bewilderment and a bit of guilt. I remember seeing traces of that chasm in the other kids around me as well, but they chose to feel sad, something I could not. Another issue that cropped up after having written this piece was the missing element of playfulness. I struggled with different definitions of play and tried to adapt this experience to some definition of a lack of inhibition, but I failed to convince myself. So this is to sort of point out that these are not easy areas when we begin to dip into our own personal frame of reference. These are not easy areas to really pin down, describe and come to an agreement on. But I still maintain that the childhood exercise or you can even call it infancy exercise if you can go back that early in your memory. I think it is a fun house of enormous amount of energy and it, it can really yield much in terms of whatever creative area we want to pursue. What it can also do is to take us out of our own immediate sense of self and we can also begin to critically watch children everywhere and I think it has a lot of lessons in terms of human nature. I will not go into theories about play right from Plato onwards. This has been an idea that has been mapped that has been articulated, discussed as a very, very fundamental human tendency, play, game, all these have been theorized about and the theoretical formulations uh, uh, whether they are from psychoanalysis or anthropology or sociology, we will look at those later on briefly to clarify uh, you know our own thought processes, but at this point in time this remains an open ended exercise, an open ended exploration, you are not trying to bind you to a specific way, but you could try out. I mean sometimes it is possible that the notion of play may not be accessible because in fact one is socialized not to give 
value to play that also can happen. All right, from play we now are moving to another kind of play and that is linked to three different domains which I would like you to dip into sports, science and arts. Now, what do I mean by the use of the term play and these three domains? So, again as I said play requires certain amount of flexibility, certain kind of looseness of being so that you can let go a little bit and say alright, I am game for this activity. So, now two things here. I will uh, propose a set of activities to help you cut across domains. The term domain as I had pointed out earlier, it refers to certain you know widely accepted disciplinary boundaries that are currently practiced both institutionally and in terms of general discussions about different kinds of activities and the values we associate with them. The other thing that I have in mind is related to the possibility that I would like you to explore and I do not think it is a mysterious possibility, but it is a possibility of discovering the coexistence of different domains within yourself. Because again you, you know you may say that this comes from certain kind of a utopian notion about childhood, but every child uh, you know if you see children at play they are scientific in their analysis you know they establish causal links they also play games you know like th this role playing there is also creation of new roles and in that sense I feel that all of us definitely very clearly have the scientist the artist the sports person in us also what this can do is to help you discover the activity that you enjoy the most. So, now two words are emphasized in this discussion. One is the notion of play and the other is the notion of enjoyment. So, now we are ready for some playing around. In India uh, or in the ancient usage uh, the word play is also Leela. You are ready for some Leela some play. So, now even if you have not played games and I when I was conducting this activity uh, it became very clear to me that there is a gender divide there. Most of the boys in the class of course were ready to sort of talk about some well defined sport uh, which means uh, it is a game with rules and regulations and that they play uh, fairly frequently. But the girls in the class, they, they it took some time to even remember what kind of sport they played. And I wanted some kind of physical sport of course, but you can have other kind of uh, sport like chess etc. which does not require physical effort. But I was hoping that they would choose something that requires physical effort. Because I was trying to pitch it against the nature of enjoyment in more abstract activities. So, that was my sort of uh, agenda you can say, but there was certainly a gender divide there. Although I myself uh, really have uh, played sport right from earliest childhood stages, but I think there is for obvious reason reasons there is a gender divide we may uh, be able to talk about it later. So, now whether you are a boy or a girl play a game if you have not played a game and then do this exercise. Some of the suggestions that can help you recreate the joy and demands of play. Maybe later on even the theoretical angles can be woven in other modules. I will have to wait and see how this plays out. So, now think of this particular sport that you have participated in. Obviously, there will be some time lag between what you have played and what you are going to describe. So, doing and showing these two things you can keep in mind 
again remember we have asked you to maintain a diary we have asked you to note down your observations we have asked you to dip into your experiences and retain fairly well developed frame of reference for yourself so keeping in mind our uh, you know suggestion that you maintain this diary so this is a writing process but it is also a process of doing one by playing the spot that you are describing and two then describing it so to show what happened to describe what happened and so in terms of this activity we would like you to describe the locale the game itself and its rules now you don't have to sort of do this point by point but in your write up you can keep in mind some of these suggestions now while playing this game how did enjoyment occur so again there is emphasis on the term enjoyment because we are trying to figure out the sources or the places or the conditions which release a sense of joy in you that's why although we value diversity and also different sensibilities but let us try and do if indeed there are situations and activities that lead to a certain sense of enjoyment now you may say that the term enjoyment itself is a contested term we don't know what that means but let's start with the simple meaning of the term something fun something that you like it makes you feel good so let's stay with those simpler definitions we can have more complex discussions later on when we deal with some theoretical formulations about enjoyment in the next lecture uh, the sort of formulations offered by a theoretician who, whose name is shikshant mihai so then how did enjoyment occur also describe how excitement peaked how often do you practice how long have you been playing the game describe a great feat in that sport now this may kind of surprise you this last idea as to why one would sort of ask you to describe a great feat in that sport i think the idea stems from the fact that you know when we like a sport or we like an activity usually we also are greatly inspired by great achievements in that field now this may again be a contested way of looking at this issue but i feel that you know it is without having role models it's really very very difficult to aspire to be a better player you know many times in sports the coaches they ask their the young enthusiast to watch some very good players at work and that's part of their coaching so just to watch just to see how they play and so on and so forth so therefore this is close to the idea of you know canonize or classic writing uh, you know in terms of reading writing lists also but i think it would be fun to see dip into this and see if you can describe a great feat in that spot now how you construct that write up is your own decision on that there are no limits but these are the pointers that you could take in mind you need not keep that in mind while playing because surely if this is you have a you know great model in your mind you will not be able to play like that great model so but you know in describing the feats i think that will help i'm also leading you on to the theoretical formulations of shikshant mihai by doing this open ended exercise so it is really in some ways introduction to some of the ways in which shikshant mihai later on theorized about enjoyment and how to optimize your sense of enjoyment what are the optimal conditions for enjoyment here is this uh, quote right now while we were recording the world cup had already happened and there was this whole atmosphere like the mahakumbh you know where 
the whole country was joyous and everyone felt connected, everyone felt enthused and therefore it is quite appropriate to take an example from this contemporary situation where a certain person is seen as an ideal in the sport that most Indian seems to love uh, and that is cricket. This is a quotation from Mahendra Singh Dhoni on Sachin Tendulkar. Uh, I have been talking to students, I have been talking to my children, I have been talking to the teaching assistants who have participated in shaping the PowerPoint presentations and also some of the discussion related to the content. And there is this general agreement despite the diversity of people I have been talking to that indeed both Mahendra Singh Dhoni and Sachin Tendulkar have emerged as marvelous role models for young Indians, not only for the sport that they play, but in terms of a way of life, a way of life of perseverance, dreams, hard work, honesty, transparency, everything that we actually need in our society. So while we are separating the domains, the fact is that many times one domain begins to symbolize the aspirations of a country or a people and in that sense it does not remain confined only to that domain and what happens technically within that domain. So that we can keep in mind but let me quickly read this comment uh, and not really digress any further. He says Sachin uh, Tendulkar continues to give more than 100 percent and his schoolboy like enthusiasm for the game is something I envy and admire. For the team he is the best available coaching manual. That is very eloquently expressed and I think both offer the kind of uh, I suppose feats and role models that you can dip into. Many of our students in the next exercise on Shiksanth Mihai in fact did write about Sachin Tendulkar that we may come to later on. Now about a scientific process or idea. So I would say that in before you start with this activity you could actually ask yourself as to what kind of attributes you link to the term science and then take this up uh, later on, especially if you are a student of the fine arts or liberal arts, many times the polarizations are, are so sharp that science is out there and art is out there. You know, they sort of do not seem to, people do not seem to talk across the disciplines. So, please do not do that. Even if you feel you know nothing about uh, advanced science, and we know very well that this is a very complex area, but even if you do not know anything about it, ask very simple questions as to what kind of attributes do you associate with. If you have a problem with that, you can ask if you know uh, causal links when you observe a phenomenon whether they can be called a science you know, or scientific way of looking at that particular phenomenon or not. In other words, do not stall this activity do the three domain activities at one go, you know, as a unit. I think that will work out very well. And it will also help us foreground some of the discussion or some of the important aspects of our discussion and I think also some kind of a sense that we need to change this polarized way of thinking about issues, whether artistic or scientific or sports related. But more than that, it is within you that these three activities coexist. So, pick up a scientific experiment or insight you have that you can recreate. Uh, why did you pick up the specific experiment or process? Do you need a lab to perform the experiment? What did you enjoy about this process? Again, what did you enjoy about this process? I am not asking if you enjoyed this process because my feeling is that when you participate in an activity actively, then there is automatically certain amount of enjoyment. So, next pointer, did the activity 
and the ensuing insight or insights change your perceptions in any way. Have you shared this insight with anyone? Can you recapture the changes that occurred from doing to showing in writing? Did you feel you were mimicking any established scientist? So these are pointers, play around with that and think of a great mind of our times who has nothing but the most extraordinary insights to offer. Uh, according to Einstein, after a certain high level of technical skill is achieved, science and art tend to coalesce in aesthetics, plasticity and form. The greatest scientists are always artists as well. So keep that in mind and move on. The last activity which you may say well, the last activity, last part of uh, description was already the you know domain of the writer. But no, I actually would not like you to club those together ideally. Now role play as a artist or a writer. So let us say if you are a scientist, now pretend that you are a writer. If you are a writer, pretend that you are a scientist. That is the kind of switching over that I am asking you to do. Although my sense is that it may not be such a difficult thing if you dip into your own definitions of what, a, what the scientific process is related to observation, empirical investigation, causality to begin with. Similarly, for an artist or a writer, you know the, the whole focus on imagination, on creating some you know fictional characters or creating, recreating reality, that is the emphasis. So, play within the rules of the game. Mix and match can occur later on, but first you know keep them separated the way they are separated in actual life in terms of institutionalizations, but actually come back to the childhood stage where they are intermixed and then finally you can have a product where you intermix it. That is the way I would ideally li like this to work. So now if it is an act of writing and not painting or something, even if it is painting or something, I would like you to do this very rapidly. After completing the activity, narrate it in great detail with reference to the medium or the material chosen, ease or difficulties of the task, the sense of pleasure or frustration you may have experienced, do not you know undermine them, mention them, reasons for these emotions, you know why did you feel frustrated, why did you feel pleasure any well established figure you emulated because everything said and done for writers also there are other writers who inspired them who also in, in ways live within them because they have read them and enjoyed them so much that part of that writing, part of that world view, part of that stylistic mechanism seems to circulate within ourselves. So do that. And I again want to dip into what Salman Rushdie had said earlier, uh, I mean he had said it many years back, but we had mentioned this in our earlier lecture where he says until I started writing Midnight's Children which would probably have been about late 75, early 76, there was this period of flailing about. It was more than a technical problem until you know who you are you can't write. So in case you have difficulties, this is really uh, not something that you should worry about. You can uh, look at other writers and see how many of these issues may be related to your own search for your identity or your sense of self. And in other words, this is searching module that we would definitely like you to consider when you write. Now writing for us at this point in time is an exercise every one of you can benefit from whether you are a scientist, a potential or future writer, 
student of literature, painting, design or sports also. We feel that this is a common activity or a basic activity that leads to greater self analysis and self analysis that can lead to productive results. This is another uh, quotation that, that I have placed before you and that is again related to certain crucial similarities between scientific and literary activities and the reason we have placed it here is related to the fact that this is a good opportunity for you to begin to think about the issues of certain common ground. I was talking about the absence of common ground for conducting discourse on creativity. So, this provides a common ground. This is a very important uh, quotation and I will quickly read this out. It says that the notion of metaphor can serve to illuminate the nature of scientific creativity by equating in a metaphoric sense a scientific discovery with a poetic metaphor. For in perceiving a new idea in science, the mind is involved in a similar form of creative perception as when it engages a poetic metaphor. We would have to go into the nature of metaphors and how they link two different kinds of objects uh, or uh, you know ideas and makes them into find similarities between two different uh, kind of ideas or perceptions. But right now we will not really go into it, later on we will conduct some metaphor related exercises, we will keep that in mind. But right now the idea is to really look at these three activities and do something with them and map out or describe your experiences as clearly and as vividly as possible. So, again this is what we are re-emphasizing. Finally, what you can do then after you know you have undertaken the activities separately, what you can do is to generate an activity in which all the three elements are intermixed in any permutation combination of your choice. And let your imagination dictate this activity. Your own background and interest will dictate the direction this activity will take. Fuse them in any way you want in an absolutely non-restrictive manner to allow for fresh possibilities. And now we would have one of our students who has undertaken precisely this kind of a blend and I have also requested him to share his own creative endeavors so that you can see how he has intermixed three domains in his write up uh, and also his own preoccupation with creativity. This is a kind of starting point of his own search and what he has done in the three domain activity is to fuse sport with writing and in that sense it is an intermix. You will hear him and see how that has uh, unfolded so far as he is concerned. Hello, I am Mohit Sharma. I will be talking about the three domain activity that we undertook as a part of this course. So, the three domain activity had three components which required us to talk uh, about our experiences with sports, a concept of science as well as an art form. So, for the sport component I took up the sport of table tennis which I have taken to quite recently. Uh, for the scientific phenomena I went back to this realization that I had when we first studied uh, ma magnetics and realized that Newton's third law breaks down in the field of magnetodynamics. As regards the art form, I will be talking about the art of photography. So, the essence of composition in photography as with most other arts is to simplify and exclude. Every scene must be reduced to its very basic components and then analyzed. This give you, gives you a sense of what truly gives a scene the character that it has. The simplification comes relatively easily to me or so I would believe from the same grounding in reductionist approaches to problems. Also, I have been able to understand and internalize the technical knowledge of how a camera works and how it should be tinkered with for different scenes and settings which I attribute to the environment I have been a part of for the last few years. 
now I would go on to show you a few uh, photographs and explain this component a bit. So as regards the uh, reductionist approach in uh, photography, in this particular photograph, I wanted to really focus on the, on the reflection of the buildings in the water. But as you can see, that really does not end up being the central fo focus of this photograph. We have a lot of, uh, so to speak, clutter you know, at the very top half of the photograph. So I went in and this was the final result, which came out far better than even I had anticipated it. This is from one of the masters of photography, Elliot Irvitt. Uh, note how he has composed the scene. There is the water, there is a sunset scene, there is a rocky beach of sorts. But then there is also the human element involved and the kind of feelings that the entire scene provokes in humans. Finally, this is a photograph from another celebrated photographer, Steve McCurry. Now, most of us tend to look at Taj Mahal in a very isolated sense only for what it is. Any scene, any monument has its entire importance in what it means to the people around it. So in a sense, this placement, the fact that this train probably goes from here every day, it might be discontinued now, but the fact that it did at that point in time, it gives a strange sense of uh, completeness, which would otherwise be rather missing from this photograph if it was only the Taj Mahal which was to be claimed. Thank you. Thank you, Mohit, for sharing your work. Um, I'm sure uh, we will talk to you in other lecture modules also. Here is a suggested reading for the rest of you. Uh, please use it selectively. Don't feel daunted by the list. We just thought that it is appropriate to share it with you, just as in case there is a particular angle that you want to understand better. So we'll start with this book by uh, Baum and Pete, titled Science, Order and Creativity. This is a book I have really liked for a very long time and have used it extensively in number of courses that I have taught. So that deals with metaphors and how that is a connecting link in the perceptual work of science and also uh, literature. The second book is by Brandy Dorothea, Becoming a Writer and it obviously states its own case through the title itself. Kuzik, Edmund, Jenny Newman, etc. Their book, The Writer's Workbook, is also very handy for people who have started to write. So, you know, it's the kind of book one can use uh, in very, very early stages of writing. So, you can selectively use it and especially for diary and also for exercises pertaining to one's own empirical work, you know, observation of the world around and how one can begin to articulate one's ideas. I think it, it offers some very good tips. The next book is by the famous physicist Feynman and that's a book of his lectures. There are lots of books that he himself has written that you know are read extensively. Uh, I think he belongs to this uh, very special brand of great scientists who also have the ability to communicate the gist of scientific concepts and also the pleasure in doing science to other people who are not necessarily involved in doing science. So both conceptually and also in terms of the act of communication, writings of many scientists uh, in the last three decades in particular have really offered tremendous richness to the reader in general. So the Feynman lectures and then there's this book, Kitely Bryan, uh, The 3 AM Epiphany, Uncommon Writing Exercises That Transform Your Fiction. You can again have a look at some of the exercises and see what, what is useful for you. Rob Pope's book, uh, I really would like to you know, recommend strongly for those who are theoretically sort of governed in their thought process. Each and every chapter is extremely well constructed and theoretically very deeply worked out. The mm -hmm. chapter on play, play and notion of play as an alternative conceptual category for understanding creativity will offer you a great deal of insight. 
but this is a book you would have to read gradually if you are not used to theoretical formulations within uh, cultural areas. The last book which is a recent one that has been published as you can see is uh, edited or written by actually, actually it's written by Morley David it's called the Cambridge introduction to creative writing that also is full of very in valuable insights. I am able to endorse some uh, better than the others because these I have started dipping into more recently, but that does not mean that others are not equally important and interesting. Some of the films you can look at in terms of sports and its complexities uh, are films that we have also been looking at in order to be able to talk about sports, games in naive, simple, shy like manner, but at the same time sort of keep in mind the complexities that they represent, but we have not discussed them with you. As a resource you can dip into them, Chariots of Fire, Chakde India, I am sure you know Chakde India very well already. I heard that chant during the World Cup uh, you know uh, also. Uh, Shatranj Ke Khiladi is uh, again a very, very interesting uh, film where you know if you place uh, Anand, uh, the uh, great champion against this story, you will see what that sport when it is taken to technical heights as a competitive sport, what that means. So, Vishwanatha Anand on the one side and if you see the players of Shatranj or chess in Chatranj Ke Khiladi, the story by Munshi Premchand, you can see how this game can become so obsessive that rulers who just indulged in this game without ruling the country, they let the intruding armies take over without any struggle or fight. It is a beautiful film and some of the scenes are memorable, scenes of chess players and the intruding armies. Uh, Invictus, directed by Clint Eastwood, a really a remarkable film based on the book Playing the Enemy, Nelson Mandela and the Game That Changed a Nation by John Carlin. So, we know that sports is not just about uh, playing on the field, but playing in the minds of not only just the players, but also the nation for which they play and people at large. So, it is a very complicated relationship. Uh, the next uh, reference that we would like to endorse is the TV serial Bodyline, uh, which you may be familiar with because most of you I am sure are cricket buffs. These are seven episodes uh, you know produced by Network 10 Australia. So, these are some of the resources you can dip into and enjoy and you know also enrich your understanding of all the three domains. And finally, we would like to end with a quote from the famous uh, and intriguing painter Vincent van Gogh and these are the words we would like to share. If you hear a voice within you say, you cannot paint, then by all means paint and that voice will be silenced. Thank you.